Morning, church. Let's stand to your feet if you're able this morning. It's great to be here to worship our King. Today, we have a lot to be thankful for, right? We serve a God who didn't stay in the grave, whose story didn't conclude on the cross, but that he did what the Old Testament prophesied he would do. And he defeated death, he defeated the grave. We're gonna celebrate that this morning. So put your hands together with us. Let's sing this out. I was buried beneath my shame For who could carry that kind of weight He was my tomb Till I met you And I was All my failures I try to hide, but it was my tomb till I made run this morning. We're glad you're here. We're glad you joined us to worship this morning. Today remembers the most important day to the Christian faith. Today remembers Christ's resurrection. The scripture says that we were dead in our sins. It doesn't say that we're bad in our sins. It says we were dead. We had no way out. We had no escape from our sin. But the good news is that it didn't end that way. The story doesn't end there. Jesus sent his, well, God sent his son Jesus to come to the earth, to be 100% man, also to be 100% God. 
He lived a perfect, sinless life. He came here. His purpose was to seek and to save the lost. That's us this morning. We're the lost. He came here to save us. He came here to live the life that we couldn't live and then die the death that we deserved. Took that for us. See, this morning, there's nothing we can do to earn salvation. There's nothing we can do to earn God's love. The beautiful thing is God loves us how we came in here this morning. No matter how messed up we are, God loves us how we came in. Because of that because of that love that he has for us, he sent his son Jesus to the earth to die for us, to be the sacrifice for us. That's how much he loves us. In doing that, he gave us the choice to either accept his love, his grace, and his mercy, or to reject it. The choice is ours. He laid the invitation out. So this morning, my hope for you is that either you already know Jesus or that today marks the day that you take that step of faith, that you allow Jesus into your life, that you'll be moved by today's service, that you'll feel the presence of God. Let's continue to worship. darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood atoned one final breath and it was finished but not the end could have known before the earth began to shake and the veil was torn what sacrifice was made as a hand
On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went into the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said unto them, Why do you look for the living amongst the dead? For he is not here. He is risen. They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. For our Lord has risen.
in heaven and I just pray that you let our hearts feel that today let our hearts be open to let the Holy Spirit come in and get us excited because you have resurrected from the grave we live in this world and it's hard but we have a hope and we have a future and we should have joy and I pray that if there is anyone here that does not know you and does not have that hope that today will be the day that they ask you to be their personal Savior we love you and we thank you for all that you are and all that you do for us. And in Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us this Easter morning. We're going to be looking at the idea of the hope of Easter. If you have a Bible, we're going to look at the book of John today, John chapter 20. While you're turning there, it will also be on the screen as well if you don't have a Bible today. I want to ask you a question. Have you ever noticed how fascinated we are as a culture by last words? If you Google last words, you will get 8,760,000,000 results. 8 billion different sites and articles discussing last words. You see, many are curious about what people have to say in the final moments of their life. Some people have sweet and, and meaningful words. One person told Charlie Chapman, may the Lord have mercy on your soul while he was on his deathbed. He replied, why not? After all, it belongs to him. Nostradamus predicted, tomorrow at sunrise, I shall no longer be here. Others have left their friends and loved ones perplexed by their final thoughts. Frank Sinatra's last words were, I'm losing What a sad way to end his life, and what a sad way, as those were his last words. 
But as Christians, we put a great deal of importance on last words. Not just anyone's last words, but mostly Jesus' last words. Friday night, we had a powerful and a, a somber service here at the church where we were focused on Jesus and his last days here on this earth as he was going to the cross and we finished with him on the cross and, and being buried. Christians all over the globe have been reading his final words, the final words of Jesus uh, leading up to Easter. They've been reading those for centuries. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Verily I say unto you, that today that thou shalt be with me in paradise. Woman, behold thy son. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, I thirst. Then he said, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. See, these are profound and, and they're powerful words. And after Jesus spoke them, he gave up the ghost and he died. He was taken down from the cross. He was rushed into the tomb and given a, a hurried burial so that his followers didn't have to leave his lifeless body on the cross during Sabbath. You see, we're fascinated with last words. But do we give much attention to first words? We typically don't put a whole lot of importance on first words because they're usually one-syllable words like dad, mom, or ball. Anybody, their first words were ball? Were our son's first words were ball? A ball beat us out. A ball was more important than mom or dad. That was his first words. Think about that. Usually your first words are just something that a baby has repeated. The, the mom is fighting. Get the, the first word's going to be mom. The dad's fighting for the first word to be dad. But someone's first words don't typically give any insight into what they value or what they care about deeply. But what would someone's first words be after they come back to life? I was talking to my kids about this and asking them, well, what would your first words be if you were to come back to life? My daughter goes, I'm alive. <laughs> and my son goes, Arr. I went, oh boy. <laughs> I thought that was funny, but that was not Jesus' last words. Thinking about the last words or the first words of someone that would come back to life, surely these words would be powerful. They would demonstrate what that person, what they care about. They would communicate value to whoever they were speaking to. And in a few moments, we're going to look at the first things that our Savior said on the morning of his resurrection. Well, let's begin with a word of prayer. God, we love you and we thank you. God, we're so grateful. And as we've been building all the way up to this day, all throughout this week, reading about what your son went through for us. God, it's a somber moment that we left with on Friday, but it's an exciting day today. We're forever grateful that you sent your only son to die on the cross for us. You sent him to a world that would hate him. And all because of love, he loved us and he gave himself willingly for us. We come together today, Lord, to, to celebrate the resurrection that our God is not dead, he is alive and he's alive forevermore. That he's up in heaven and he's preparing a place for those who have believed in him. We celebrate today because we serve a living God, a living Jesus. And we are forever grateful for the gift that you've given to us. This miracle that was given to us in that while we were yet sinners, you sent Jesus to die on that cross so that we could go to heaven. Today we celebrate you. We celebrate the resurrection. We celebrate all the things that allow us to know that we have security and we have hope through Jesus Christ, that we can one day go to heaven. We love you and we thank you, and I, I pray that every word that is said today would be honoring to you. I pray that your word would come alive to us today and that we would see hope in what your word says. We love you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to pick up where we left off on Friday, but we're going to be looking in John chapter 20 now. And read with me from John 20, the account of what led up to these first words that Jesus spoke after being resurrected. John 20 and verse 1 says, The first day of the week, 
cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark. She came unto the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. We begin with the perspective of Mary Magdalene here and to put ourselves in her shoes for just a minute. Mary, she is just had the worst 72 hours of her life. Just days before she had watched Jesus as he entered into the city of Jerusalem and all the fanfare and all the excitement that came along with that, all of that that was typically given to a king. The processional was led by Jesus and he was on a donkey. As they marched towards Jerusalem, there were shouts of admiration, shouts of Hosanna, the son of David. Shouts of blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Shouts of Hosanna the highest. But as the week went on, something had gone terribly wrong. The crowds that had loved him that day had now turned on him. She saw him tried and betrayed. She saw him beaten and executed. And then to make things worse, she and his followers, they weren't permitted to give him a proper burial. All she she could think of was giving him the simple honor of a proper burial. She woke before there was even any light in the sky. She had no alarm clock, so this means that she probably spent a sleepless night just waiting for Sabbath and just waiting for the sunrise. When she arrived at the tomb, she saw the stone had been rolled away and there was no body inside. Can you imagine the feelings that overcame her in this moment? Her first reaction was likely, just when I thought it couldn't get any worse. Just when I thought I had gone through everything I could possibly go through. Now someone has stolen the body of Jesus. Her second reaction is to go tell someone. So she ran to Peter and she ran to John and They were most likely in the upper room where the disciples were staying. And now our focus, it shifts from her to now Peter and John, this other disciple. Look now at verse 3. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter. I love the imagery here. I love the, the all the facts here that we're seeing here. He did outrun Peter. And he came first to the sepulcher, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter, following him, and went into the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw, and he believed." For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Verse 10, then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Now, can you imagine what Peter is going through? Imagine what Peter is thinking. Peter was one that seemed ready to fight at any time. He was ready for a good brawl. He's ready for anything. He's the guy that grabbed a sword and cut off the ear of the soldier. I'm wondering what he's thinking in this moment as Mary comes to them and says, the body of Jesus is gone. I wonder if he's in shock. Maybe anger is overcoming him. As they begin to run, is he thinking that someone stole Jesus' body or did Jesus truly come back from the dead? Maybe all this thinking is what caused him to lose his first mini marathon. Can you imagine as they're running and and Peter's running, he's boisterous, he's angry. Whatever he's thinking, he's going along running. And then here comes John, just flies on by him. I wonder if that angered him even more. Okay, I lost this race. I'm ready to run even more. He's thinking all these things and John beats Peter to the tomb. But the interesting thing here is that John stops And he just looks in to see the the burial clothes that are there, but there's no body. He just stops just right there at the doorway. And he peeks in and he looks in. 
But again, remember Peter, he's boisterous. He, he's a, a man's man. He's coming running. You beat me, but I'm going all the way in, right? Your kids, whenever you're, you're racing to the car or something, uh, the kids are running and it's the first person that gets to the car. They're like, I made it to the car. The other one jumps in. Well, I made it inside the car. That's Peter. I got in the sepulcher. I'm in there. He goes right in. And he examines further and he sees the clothes, but also he sees the napkin that's folded neatly. John now comes in and it says that he saw and he believed. Verse 5 tells us that John saw, meaning that it was a glance or it was just a look. Verse 6 tells us that Peter seeth, meaning that he was looking closely now. He's observing. But verse 8 says John saw, meaning he was perceiving now with intelligent comprehension. This was no robbery. This was different. You see, Jesus had told them that this would happen, but they fully didn't understand it. You're going to raise from the dead. We don't really understand those things. He compared himself to Jonah in Matthew 12 and verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. What does that mean, Jesus? Jesus had clearly announced his resurrection after three days several times to them. Look at Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. They didn't like hearing that. And he said, and be raised again the third day. Then look at Matthew 20 and verse 19. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him. And the third day he shall rise again. They weren't fully comprehending it. They didn't fully grasp what was going on here. But the pieces of the puzzle, they were slowly coming together for them. Now look at verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the one at the other feet, and where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Mary arrived back at the tomb, and the two people that Mary expected to be right there with her, the two people that were supposed to console her, and the two people that were supposed to care more than anyone on the planet, they were leaving as she was getting to the sepulcher. They somehow seemed okay with what had happened here, and Mary just didn't understand she was probably exhausted physically. Just remember, she was going on no sleep and she had walked in the pre-dawn hours from where she was staying in Jerusalem all the way to the tomb. She then ran from the tomb to the upper room and, and now back. She's probably exhausted mentally. The one she had put her faith in has been executed in front of her. She had not been able to say goodbye properly. And it appeared now that his body had been stolen and, and now the people that she expected to understand and to be there for, they had left her alone standing there by herself. She was probably exhausted emotionally and she just lost it. The word for crying that we read here in verse 12 is the same word used throughout the New Testament for wailing. This is not a little sniffle. She was beyond distraught. She was inconsolable. Now we know the story. We know what's going on. We know what happened. But we're trying to put ourselves in her shoes to understand what she has gone through up to this point. And now as she comes to the grave, as she comes there just to put some ointment on him, just to make him smell a little bit better, just to give him a proper burial, the body is gone. How can this get any worse? And she wails and she cries. She's upset. And what does she see now? As she stoops down, probably crying so hard, that now she's looking into the sepulcher. She's on her knees just wailing and crying, and she looks in, and she sees two angels dressed in white. They ask her why she's crying, and she tells them what she thinks has happened. Look back at verse 13. Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Imagine the mental the emotional, the physical wear and tear that has gone on her now. 
She's wailing because the body is gone. And this is, this is upsetting her so badly. But now look at verse 14. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back. And she saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. As soon as these words came out of her mouth, because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid them, all of a sudden she turns around and, and she sees Jesus standing there. We don't know why, but she did not recognize him. Many have speculated maybe it was just because it was too dark. Maybe her eyes are just so cloudy with tears and, and she just can't see properly. Maybe he was concealing himself. We don't know, but what we see is that she saw Jesus behind her. She turns right back to the tomb. She's convinced that someone has stolen the body of Jesus. I can't help but think that Jesus had a smile on his face in this moment. As he's standing there watching her, as he sees what's going on with her, he has this smile on his face because he sees this person that he's loved. This person that he had healed of demonic possession. That's the Mary Magdalene we're talking about. Why is she wailing so bad? Why is she upset? Because Jesus had made a difference in her life. And he's looking at this woman here. He sees love. He sees what he has done for her. He sees this person who had followed him so faithfully. But he also sees a woman that has lost all hope. I think that Jesus was smiling because he knew. In a matter of seconds, just by speaking a few words to her, he was going to change her life completely. Her hope would be restored. And this hope wouldn't be for an earthly kingdom or a temporary place. No, this hope would be for an eternal kingdom, an everlasting peace. Now look at John chapter 20 and verse 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Now we've been asked twice, now why are you weeping? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be a gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. If you're the one that took him away, please tell me where. I will do something with his body. I wonder why she thought he was the gardener. Why? Because she did not expect Jesus to be there. She didn't expect a resurrection she didn't expect to ever have hope anymore. After that long week, her hope was gone. It was all lost. And now that little bit of hope that I can at least give him a proper burial, it's been completely taken away. All hope is lost. Look now at verse 16. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. As I was studying this and reading through this, I don't know why this hit me so hard. Jesus came into this seemingly hopeless situation and he changed everything with one word. As soon as he said her name, Mary. It makes me think of the passage in John chapter 10 and verse 27. My sheep, they hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Your sheep know his voice. When Jesus said Mary, it changed everything. She understood exactly who he was because she knew she had been following him. She knew his voice. She knew who he was. Maybe think about with my kids, whenever I call my kids, there could be a crowd of people yelling and screaming and all kinds of stuff. But as soon as I say, Braden, Addison, they pipe up. They look to me, okay, because they know they'll get in trouble if they don't come, right? They're probably looking right now through the wall over there. Oh, I heard my name. I'm in trouble. I better come. Braden, Addison, why? Because they know my voice. They know who I am. They know I love them. They know I care for them. They know who I am. And Mary, in this moment, such a small thing, but how powerful it is that as he says this, Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turns herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, my master. Everything changes in a moment. Look now at verse 18. See, he tells her in that verse, in verse 17, not to touch him, 
but to go again to the disciples, and this time not with a message of lost hope, but a message full of hope. Verse 18, Mary Magdalene came, and she told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. This person, this woman, who minutes before was weeping, and not only weeping, but she was wailing, She had obviously had no hope left in her, and she was now bringing this message of hope to everyone else. See, this question comes up a lot and comes up each year from people that I know. People that I'm around out in the world, they say, why is Easter so important? What's so important about this day? Why does it matter that we celebrate the resurrection? You see, many and many have called to, on gods, and, and they've called to gods, and, and they worship things that were not truly God, but they were things. And there's something different about the God that we came in here to worship today. The why we can sing, why we can raise our hands, why we worship him is there is something different. And you see, a resurrected Jesus changes everything. He is unlike any other God, little g. He's unlike any other idol, any other thing in this world. Jesus' resurrection means something different. A resurrected Jesus means that even when life seems to be at its worst, God is still working. A resurrected Jesus means that all the things that he has said about living with eternity in mind and not just for the present is a life worth living. See, a resurrected Jesus means that when all seems hopeless, there is hope. All because of this resurrection, because he said who he was and he did what he said he was going to do. He rose from the dead. What other God has done that? What other man has done that, has raised himself from the dead? God loving us so much sent his son to die on the cross, but not to stay dead, but to rise again. I want you to think about for that for a second. The absolute best that Mary Magdalene hoped for on that morning, the best possible scenario she could have imagined was the opportunity to come to the body, to clean some dry blood off of a corpse and to anoint him with oil. That's all she was hoping for. That's all she wanted that morning. But a resurrected Jesus meant that she got more than she could ever hope for. My question for you this morning is, do you have that hope? Do you have this hope of peace, this purpose in this life and and the promise of eternity with him? In the next, do you have hope in your life? The Apostle Paul writes this in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Listen to these words, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It says, for with a heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. See, when we put our faith in him, a resurrected Jesus means there is hope no matter what. So my question is, how did you come into this room? Did you come in because it's Easter Sunday and I just need to come to church? It's one of those things that I do. Or did you come looking for hope? Did you come in here hopeless? Not really knowing what this life is all about. Not really knowing what the purpose of life is. What the meaning of life is. And maybe things are going bad in your life. And, and you're just frustrated. You're struggling with this life. And what is the purpose of this life? I'm here to give you hope through Jesus Christ. Through his resurrection. Because of what he did on the cross. Because of being buried and raised again. There is hope for you. There is hope for eternity. This life is not the, there are, there are all that there is to it. This is a temporary th- place. The Bible tells us that it is temporary. It is only for a short time and then eternity is forever. Many live their lives for the here and now. What can I gain? What can I get? What can I have? All these kind of things. How can I get possessions and power? And they live for the here and now. I'm here to tell you that there's something more important and that is heaven and that is all eternity. And my hope here and my prayer here is that you know Jesus so that one day when you die, you can know him And that you can go to heaven and live there for all of eternity. So I come bringing hope. I think about Mary Magdalene and how she came to that tomb. And maybe you came to church today in the same way. 
I'm coming because I was invited. I'm coming just because it's a good thing to do. I came for the kids so they can get some Easter eggs and, and some, get some candy and some prizes and things like that. That's why I came, but I'm here to give you something more important and more powerful than that, and that is hope in Jesus Christ. Romans 10 verse 9 says, All you have to do is confess with your mouth that the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead and you shall be saved. That is why we celebrate today. That is why Easter Sunday is so important. That is why Resurrection Sunday is so important because we're focused on Jesus and what he did for us and he's done for you. I would like for everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. I know this is the time where you kind of turn off your mind because it's, it's the end of the sermon. It's, it's uh, time to sing one more song and be done, but please don't turn off your mind just yet. I want you to hear me for just a moment. The hope that we have in here, the hope that we sing about in here, the hope that we are praising God for can be your hope too. You came in here hopeless. You came in here hurting. You came in here frustrated and struggling. You can leave with hope for all of eternity. My question is, do you have that hope? Have you placed your full trust in Jesus Christ? As the Bible says, all you have to do is confess with your mouth Believe in your heart that God is who he said he is, that he raised him from the dead, and you shall be saved. All you have to do is admit, say, you know what, I'm a sinner. I understand I've done wrong things, I've done bad things, I, I'm struggling through life, and, and I just don't know what the purpose is. I, I'm a sinner. Would you admit that right now? Everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody's looking around. Would you admit that? As you're talking to God right now, you say, God, you know what, I, I understand I came into this place a sinner. Second part is to believe, as this verse tells us, to, to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Believe Jesus did what he said he did. Believe what the Bible says about Jesus, that this is a risen Savior, that he is resurrected, and we believe on him, and we say, I believe you are who you said you are. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you're the Son of God. I believe you came to this earth as a baby. I believe in that, and I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that you were buried and I believe that you were raised up again and that you're up in heaven. You're preparing a place up there. I believe in that. So I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe in the Savior. The Bible tells us in this verse that all we have to do is call upon his name. Very simple and very easy. Some people don't understand how, how, how is it so easy? How is it so easy to get in heaven? Because Jesus did it all. In this last week, we see all the things that Jesus went through to make it so easy for you that all you have to do is admit you're a sinner, believe on him, and just call on his name. God, I believe. I believe that through your son, Jesus Christ, that I can go to heaven. I believe in what you said you are. I believe in those things. And I'm calling on you right now. God, I want you to be my savior. I want to go to heaven when I die. I don't want to go to that awful place of hell. I want to go to heaven. I want to live for eternity in glory. Those three simple things are easy enough. You admit, you believe, and you call on Jesus. And my friend, you can know for 100% sure that when you walk out of this building, you can know that you're saved. You can know that heaven is your home for all of eternity. Just those three things. With everybody's heads bowed and eyes closed and nobody's looking around whatsoever. You say, you know what, pray for me. I'm struggling with this idea. This idea of hope. I came into this room and you know what, I don't know if Jesus is my Savior. I don't know if I were to die today. I don't know if I were to go to heaven or if I were to go to hell. I don't know. I'm not going to single you out. I'm not going to embarrass you whatsoever. I just want to pray for you. If that's you today and you say, I don't know, Pastor James, would you pray for me that I would know those things? If that's you, would you just slip your hand up real quick? Say, you know what, Pastor James, pray for me. I see one hand. Is there anybody else? I see another hand. Anybody else? Pastor James, pray for me. I don't know. If I were to die today, I don't know if I would go to heaven or hell. Those two people that raise their hands, I'm praying for you right now, and I'll just pray for you in just a moment. But I'm telling you right there in your seat, if you admit you're a sinner, you believe in who he is and you call on him right this moment you can know for all eternity that you're saved 
For those that say, you know what? I believed on Jesus. I know where my eternity will be. I know that I'm going to heaven. As a prayer of thanks, would you raise your hand praising God that you know for 100% sure that you're going to heaven. Many hands raised. Praise the Lord. Dear Lord, we love you and we thank you. God, we thank you for this day where we can totally focus on you and what you've done for us. This past week was awful just thinking about the things that you've gone through, but today is a celebration knowing why you did what you did. You stole death. You allowed us a place to go for all of eternity. We can now know for 100% sure that we're going to heaven because of what you did. You are the door. You are the way. Jesus, we believe in you and we, we thank you for what you did for us. God, I pray for the ones that raised their hands just now that said that they don't know for 100% sure. I pray that they would ask you today into their hearts. They would believe on you and call on you that you could be their savior today. And know that when they do that, that it's, it's final. It's 100%. I praise you and I thank you for that, but I also, I thank you for the ones that raised their hands today saying that they know for 100% sure that they're going to heaven. Thank you for that. We praise you. Today on <clears throat> Easter Sunday, on Celebration Sunday here, we thank you and we praise you for all that you've done for us in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing a final song. I'll come up and explain what's going to happen after the song is over. But I urge you, if God is working in your life, then do something today. For those that raised their hands and said they didn't know about salvation, please come see me after the service. I would love to talk to you and love to help you to know that you can know for 100% sure that you're going to heaven. So we're going to sing this final song. It's a very powerful song, and I pray you'll sing it out as a celebration of what Jesus did for us. Like Pastor James said, this last song, a very powerful song. Uh, there's so many songs out there that we sing that when you go through <clears throat> each verse in the chorus, it's kind of almost like the way I look at it is a step-by-step -step of uh, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Um, and this is one of those songs. And I just, I ask you guys, when we get to verse 4, uh, which starts with our Savior displayed on a criminal cross, one of the things that I like to do is when I'm singing, uh, whether you do it or not, that's your choice. Uh, but I like to just close my eyes and just let everything else that's around me just drown it out. Just close my eyes and just sing. And I think you'd be surprised at what you can, in that moment, get out of it. Uh, so I encourage you guys, when we get to that verse, just listen to the words and just kind of put yourself in that, in that place of, at that time in history. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope and no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested in my life And dash was redeemed only beauty remains and my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet my feet rose to dance and my life began oh your grace oh She's a
criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then Jesus arose with our freedom in heaven. Cause that's when death was arrested and my life began. For oh, your grace, oh. in my